to this talk um, that I have called Our Journey Through Antwerp. And if I say our journey, uh, I would say it's a journey that uh, we have taken uh, over the years with our office, um, having had the opportunity to do a number of uh, projects in Antwerp. Our office is uh, called Noah Architecten. Um, we have an office in Brussels. And uh, my name is Anne Fontaine. I'm one of the three partners together with Jitze van den Berg and Philippe uh, Vierin. We founded the office around 20 years ago. Um, so that's the name. <laughs> Besides being in Brussels, we also have a small dépendance uh, in Bruges. Um, so we work from two locations that both have a kind of a historical uh, context. This is the office in Brussels where we, around 15 years ago, bought this former paper factory that we transformed uh, into our studio where we still work and where we still enjoy very much this uh, inner garden that we have created there and became a kind of uh, second uh, second office nearly, second meeting place, uh, second place to enjoy. Um, in our office, we, we have also this special place, uh, very important to us, which is located in the uh, former shop of the factory and which we use as kitchen, as meeting room, as table tennis room, um, and gives us another relation to the street. But as said, we're not architects from Antwerp. So going to Antwerp is a bit of a journey and a bit of, um, you know, a trip. Uh, the project I will show is, uh, of course, not just uh, done by the three of us, but uh, by a group of people. This is a picture of some years ago. Um, but just to say, it's always a collaboration with many uh, young architects, older architects, quite international at the moment. We're around 25 uh, people, just to give you an idea of um, faces and sizes. So um, I'm happy to take you on, uh, on our journey uh, so far through the city of Antwerp. And um, I'd love to show you six uh, projects. Uh, five of them are located in the city center or in its direct periphery. And the sixth one is a bit outside. So I'll start with showing you two projects in the historical uh, center uh, of the city. Uh, where you see the number one. This is a, the oldest building actually of the, of the city. It's called the Steen, like stone. And, and I'll, I'll talk to you about it in a minute, where that comes from. Number two is the museum Planta Moretus, um, UNESCO listed museum for which we build um, a depot, the archives for their very precious um, uh, material collection that they have. Three and four will be buildings that actually serve or are at the service of the life in the city, you could say, in providing uh, electricity and heating, quite peculiar projects and um, very nice ones also to work on because the program is, one could say, quite straightforward. Um, and then number five is part of a development uh, in an area of the city called the Eilandje. I'm sure many, many architects in this series will talk about projects there because it has been developed over the last years um, as a sort of um, extension to the city with new, new housing. And it's interesting because it's on this, you know, edge or this moment where the city really meets the harbor. Uh, and that's quite something knowing that the harbor of Antwerp is one of Europe's most uh, important uh, harbors. Um, moving out then will be, you see the map that I just showed you in the center bottom, and in the right top corner, you see this red needle. <laughs> uh, and that is the project I would like to end with. It's, um, it's a hospital project, and it's a project for specifically for palliative care. So in a certain way, it's also the end of many journeys and um, it has been a very, you know, very um, special and honor, <laughs> honored way to make architecture for that purpose. 
So I'd like to start with uh, the oldest building of the city, um, Hetstein. You see the red dot here a bit more in detail um, with its location. And when we zoom in a little bit, you see that um, it has a quite a peculiar, peculiar form or footprint, uh, which within the line of buildings that it sits in is even more strange. Um, it is because, uh, of course, it didn't belong in that context for most of its life uh, and is a kind of leftover uh, of something I would say nearly more important than what we see now. The darker buildings in the map are uh, the cathedral in the heart of the city uh, and the town hall very near to, the, to this very old core of the city and a guild house also next to it, a guild house of the butchers. Um, but how did that building get there? Uh, it's maybe good to understand when we talk about uh, the project uh, in more detail. And you can see here um, how this building, pinkish in the drawing, was part of the first walled settlement that would become Antwerp. Um, and Antwerp, a city as it is now, quite a large city for Flanders. Um, and it was part of that fortification. The river was there, but also a canal protecting even more uh, that very specific uh, starting point. And here you see, let's say the first, this image was like 12th, 12th century. Um, here you see how the city grew uh, in that fragment between probably 13th and 18th century growing, of course, uh, much wider than the drawing shows you, but also how already the walled part is opened up towards the north and the canal has given form to how the city develops. You can still see that in the city today, this beautiful um, circular shape of streets and buildings. But you see also that the building already becomes part of a less defined uh, specific fabric. And then when we look, of course, at the end of the 19th century, uh, industrialization became very important, efficiency of transport as well, also along that river Schelde, which is really a stream, a wide uh, river leading with, with transport over ships really deep into the country, um, relating of course to that harbor. Um, the river was cut straight and all the buildings relating to uh, that old <laughs> core were demolished. Um, in that first zone of the, of the new river border or shoreline. Um, and at the very last moment before completely disappearing, people started to protest against that action and saved actually what is now called the Sting. Uh, that's how it ended up being kind of strange, solitary volume in a more industrialized part of the city. Um, and that's also how somehow it was at the end of the 19th century also extended, transformed and brought much more into a kind of imagination of a castle, much more than a kind of a fortress. So a lot of um, fantasies uh, were, were manifested architecturally. And you see here that, you know, it just seems to have nothing to do anymore with what was once the sort of protective side uh, or wall of, of, of the city of Antwerp. Um, what you see here also relates, of course, to that end of the 19th century. So you see in the right part of the, of the image, you see the building, you see the river, you also see that not all boats were um, transporting goods. There was also the sort of pleasure and leisure coming uh, or becoming part of the city as people, also the, the, um, the working class people would have a bit more leisure time. So they would on Sundays go for a walk, uh, for a promenade along, along the river. And the city was also developed in that way. And you can see it in the middle of the image along um, the stain to promenades, kind of boardwalks were built but on a higher level. So one could, uh, on the one hand, use the case uh, in a functional way and then have this flannery, let's say, through the city on top of that. Um, this is how 
the place looked uh, when we started uh, the competition, a competition organized by the Vlaams Baumeister, so our governmental architect, uh, with the mission of, let's say, controlling or guaranteeing the quality of architecture that is built with public money, an institution now existing since a bit more than 20 years and having been fundamental in how in Flanders, you know, the consciousness about making architecture has, has risen. Uh, it has been also installed at the beginning of our, actually the installment of the government architect and our office by chance, it kind of happened in parallel or in, at the same moment and developed parallel. So we have profited as young architects enormously of this new kind of interest that uh, was created to build, to make good public buildings. So this is a picture on top of that promenade where people still today uh, on Sundays go for a walk or a stroll. And you see, uh, you see the building, the, the stain that you recognize from the previous images, uh, but you see also an extension that was made in the 50s. Um, when we walk around it, from one side, it still looks quite like a fortress, you could say, and you can very beautifully read the different times and building layers in that, in the, in the texture of the building itself. You can also see traces of water levels having risen um, and, and different, I would say, imaginations having kind of added one on top of the other to come to this uh, quite weird building. Uh, from within the city, you also see here a kind of ju juxtaposition of very different architectures, um, very different cuts. If you look at the left side, the tower within the small buildings, <laughs> it's like a part has been cut out and then things have been glued together again. And then in, uh, at the right side, this 50s building, which looks more like a villa uh, than anything else. That's this one. So the building also serves as a passage, you know, through it, you can walk onto the boardwalk. So it's, it's a public, mm, not just a building, but really a set of public infrastructure of flannery, I would say. Um, and the last image, when you're on the lower level, you see that villa kind of stands or sits on um, partly old, partly newly constructed bays. Um, when we looked at the building many times, we decided, and it's not that we usually decide to, you know, as a first step, start demol demol demolishing. But in this case, we found the villa not really adding to the power that this building could have. Um, as a detail, I would, I would nearly say, but of course not for the client, which is the city of Antwerp, the brief here was to turn this building uh, with or without an extension um, into the main information center on the city, tourist center, where one would have an extensive walk through the building, um, learning about the history of Antwerp. But also it had to become, and I'm talking about maybe five years ago, it had to become a new cruise terminal, <laughs> which we thought was quite, you know, in many ways, a very strange uh, brief. Uh, I think it's even getting stranger today, you know, as we all know what cruises do to cities and how they are actually not so welcome anymore. But I say the brief is somehow nearly a detail because we try to look at the building you know, beyond its program and what it could become architecturally and as a sort of set of spaces and walks through it for the, for the future, you know, beyond the time that it would serve these functions. So when taking away the villa, this is what was left over. You see to the right, the ramp going up, leading through the building to then start that promenade. Uh, and you see it's kind of weird, um, solitary character. And um, what we try to do is take our own position in which history we kind of liked most of the building because all of it is, you could say, nearly a fantasy. 
Uh, and we wanted to bring it back more to that idea of a fortress, uh, a, a building that ha has a certain stubborn uh, character um, that would be complex um, and that would add up to um, the, the maybe awkward uh, situation that, is in, that it is in. To do that, because we don't know so much about fortresses here, um, we, of course, <laughs> maybe this is tricky to talk to British audience, but we, um, we look back at one of our loves <laughs> being uh, the architecture of uh, Edwin Lutyens. And uh, of course, we all um, were intrigued by uh, the castle Drogo uh, and its history. And um, the man you see here is, uh, his name is Julius Drew. And he was a very um, wealthy man at very young age. So he had been very successful in trading groceries, I think. And um, at the age of, I believe, 33, he decided, um, I think even to stop working, but he also decided he needed to somehow prove his importance through creating the story of having also very important ancestors, which he, I believe, didn't have. So he went to Lutyens to, to build a castle. Um, castle, you, or, or many of the listeners will know, Castle Drogo. And he asked for it to be designed as something that had belonged to many generations and would have been uh, amended and changed over time. Um, an amazing uh, question, I would say, and something I think it took even uh, 20 years for, for, for them to build it and to complete it. Um, but through looking at it, we also uh, came across the term castleness. And it's funny, I, I, during the competition, we were really excited about this term, but afterwards I didn't find it again. So I, I, now I'm even not sure if it exists. But the idea of Castleness as a sort of scientific knowledge we found very, very intriguing. And we started to look, of course, uh, like Lutyens had to study, you know, what that could mean, this question. We started to be interested in these incisions, you know, towers, roof uh, lines that would differ in heights, uh, the type of windows with, with also the, the stone uh, divisions. Um, and of course, uh, stairwells, uh, slightly oversized for the dresses, you know, the ladies to fit, but also for the status of, in this case, Julius uh, Drew to be absolutely uh, convincing. Um, that's how, if you see the floor plan here of uh, back to Antwerp, our building, that's how we started to um, shape and craft, oh, yeah, um, you know, different volumes together that would on the one hand be in a strong dialogue with the existing, but would also have a very strong own presence. And you see that the cutouts that we made um, are there to um, stress uh, certain parts of the building and give them, although belonging to a whole, give them also their own um, independence somehow. Uh, of course, there was the program of the client, uh, which you see here on the ground or on the main floor of the castle, <laughs> would be the tourist uh, uh, office. Uh, from there, you could walk into the old part where most of the history of Antwerp will be told. And you see also on the left, this squarish corner with an elevator and a wide staircase. That would be always publicly accessible to bring you up to that tower and have a beautiful view over the city and, and the river, obviously. So um, without going too far in detail, I'll just talk a bit about uh, the outside of the building, uh, because then of course the second uh, question was how to materialize it. And we were very interested in these layers of these shades of uh, colors in the old building where somehow not just in the architectural expression, but also in the grain and color of the building, one could read times, layers of times and layers of um, events that have taken place, you know, whether 
influenced by the elements or by people changing, you know, how they think uh, the building uh, should look or, or be perceived. Um, and we wanted to bring the new building also somehow into that idea of time. And um, to do that, we thought of working with bricks um, that would not have these very clear areas of color, but would have a very soft gradient to go from the darkest color of the existing building all the way up to the lightest one. Um, doing that uh, during the competition made us think of the work of a, a Flemish artist uh, or Belgian artist actually, uh, Peter Vermeers, who is totally obsessed with this soft gradient of color. And you see here a number of paintings he made. These are hand hand-painted works where he scientifically or mathematically starts to mix paint and then to paint uh, it with extreme control uh, to bring that um, effect or that beauty to the surface. And we actually uh, contacted him and asked if he would be interested to go through this you know, process of uh, layering bricks uh, together with us. So we started to try to find, first of all, the right bricks. And we um, worked together with a famous brick maker uh, from Denmark, Pedersen, uh, who were also interested to develop this together. So this is a first mock-up trying to find with the bricks um, the right shades and the right tone. And then at the atelier of uh, Peter Vermeers, they started to work, you know, on the kind of like mixing paint, like mixing pigments. They started to make brick, mix bricks and try to map how that should be constructed. Um, so we try to bring their work and our work together in different drawings, finding out what would be a good way, because as you see also the existing building, of course, is not consistent color wise all the way around. Um, and we started to draw then uh, the shades of brickwork and started to work also with the shades, I just go through a number of them, of, of the joint, of the mortar to fill the joints so that one could, on paper at least, <laughs> be convinced that this very soft um, gradient and transformation of color that could take place over, over that wall. Um, so this was then the final a proposal that um, we, we, we decided on together. Um, and that's how the building would then look uh, in its context. You see also, of course, uh, the big windows, the bay window in the tower, the shape and the lines of the tower uh, going up, all are adding to this idea that we had about castleness. Um, together with Pedersen, we made then a one-on-one -on -one, uh, model in their ateliers. You see Peter uh, Vermeers here working together with here Didier of our office, um, trying to do, to really find out now how, how it could work. Um, and you see this very beautiful um, proposal. I think we were very happy with it. Now, of course, it's under construction and it proves to be <laughs> much more difficult <laughs> than working either on paper or, you know, at the factory, being in control, being doing it yourself. Uh, there's a number of elements that come in, of course, when then a contractor starts working on it with many, you know, people choosing the bricks working together, the mixing of the bricks, how they come on site. Um, and yeah, I can tell you, it's, it's quite a complex endeavor. Uh, the building will be, this is an older uh, and last uh, image of this project uh, under construction. Um, I have, I, I, I cannot show you pro uh, images of the, the building with its brick dress because it's still full of scaffolds. So I'd rather wait <laughs> until it's then kind of revealed. And um, yeah, we're very excited and very uh, in awaitance of seeing how it will work out. Uh, I must say, um, 
what we have underestimated maybe a bit is that working on the oldest building of the city is somehow also touching uh, the people still living there, you know, touching them in a sense that they feel touched, they feel addressed and they feel uh, that something really important is happening to their city. And the information that was given on the project was, you know, for the people who were interested to know, it was very much available, but there was not like a campaign of the city to uh, make an exhibition, explain that it would happen. And uh, over the last month, uh, there's been quite some discussions about what is going on here and why was it not more transparent. So it's it's quite an exciting time for us as architects because let's say it was questioned very much <laughs> all over the news, all over Belgium. So October is uh, the day for this building. Uh, but what is interesting, I think in the whole discussion, which was really, you know how people communicate on social media, it was quite upsetting and shocking. But what it makes clear is that working in architecture and working on the historical fabric of a city is something that brings about really strong emotions, you know, and maybe it showed to us that the discussion about working on cities um, would probably be good to have, you know, more public, but also with a more diverse public and not just with architects or historians, uh, but really with the people identifying with the city they live. So um, I think we'd like to start also opening up that debate and be kind of um, important figures in that sense that this could be a case to try to talk about these things in calmer, in calmer manner and with a better vocabulary, I would say, than is, than is uh, the case at the moment. Um, from the stain, we move a little bit down uh, uh, the map and you see the red dot here is um, also part of that very historical center of the city. It is the Museum Plantin Moretus um, and it's a museum, you see it here, it's stretched uh, uh, over a building block um, with having the printing house, printing offices, uh, the residence also of a 16th century, very important European printmaker called Christophe Plantin. And um, he was followed up or his work was taken over by his son-in-law who was called, uh, I think, Jan, Jan Moretus. Um, and that's why the, that's where the, the museum name uh, Plantin Moretus comes from. Maybe also important to know is that the print shop and, and printing house has been led by women always. Uh, I was very surprised to find out. And I like to also hand over that knowledge. Over four centuries, I believe, it was always the women running the place. Um, so it's a really family owned, it was a family owned business. Uh, they had their house, their printing shops, uh, like the shop as in studio, shop as in selling point. Uh, and it has become the first museum that was listed as UNESCO uh, heritage uh, ever as a museum. Our project was about creating the new archives on a very small plot of land that still belonged to, to um, the parcel of the, of the museum. Um, and it was very important because on the one hand, all their material was stored in the basements of this building and were quite close to the river. So the, the threat of, of water was high. Um, but also as it is UNESCO listed, the collection and the archives cannot be separated from the, from the site of the museum itself. So it's, um, it was, um, an interesting uh, competition to add a small block, a small building, rather closed, very um, controlled rooms to this house, um, where you see here the former living areas uh, of the family, very rich in its interior, also the wallpapers and you know golden details are kind of uh, present 
throughout the whole house. And then there are former um, workshops um, with still all the material uh, in place. You can also see how the daylight was influential on where they would work and how beautifully the machines and the architecture somehow uh, interweave. Um, some, of course, the books <laughs> were very uh, present, also floors. Just to give you an idea that if you extend, even with archives, uh, to this house, what kind of rooms do you want to create? No, what kind of, of uh, relationship are you looking for? And the brown part in the image is um, is the plot. I believe it was like 13 by 13 meters, something like that, uh, where we could um, build and where we were asked to build as much archive space as possible. So uh, footprint and height were kind of limited, but within that, the idea was to make as much space as possible, including one public part, which was of course uh, very nice, which is a, a reading room. So the museum is often visited mostly by scholars who study um, either the prints that are in the collection or either the original, you know, etching plates or that, um, that can, be, can be still consulted. So we decided um, after, you know, <laughs> looking into many options, we decided to bring the reading room to the ground floor. You can see in this image in the drawing that the street uh, where the building is located is extremely narrow. So you can only look at the building and the perspective, you can never see it frontal. Um, but also we thought bringing the reading room down can somehow open up also the activities of the museum to the street in, in making clear what is happening there and, and inviting somehow also to, to use um, that knowledge and that infrastructure. Of course, it meant that building an open space on the ground floor uh, meant that all the heavy load is above, all the archives are, are above. And um, because these archives needed to be as large as possible, it also gives some pressure on how high this uh, ground floor room can be. There is a connection uh, with the rest of the museum via the courtyard at the back, and there is a separate entrance uh, at the street in the adjacent house, but I'll show you that. Uh, Bit later. In section, it's all very compact. Uh, so you see the, the ground floor with the reading room where we spent, uh, or we were very interested in elaborating that interior in a way that would, you know, talk to the interiors of, of the rest of the house and then have volumes um, for for the collection and the archives being as efficient uh, as possible. Um, in the ground and in the basement, you have an enormous installation. Uh, you must understand that the climate in these archives, but also in the reading room, both humidity and temperature can hardly move over, you know, over the year. So it's extremely important that it's all very much protected from outdoor, uh, from the elements, you know, changing temperatures. Uh, also how people enter, not bringing in wet coats and um, bringing in too much uh, influences. But what was also interesting is finding out how to protect these archives from a fire. Because uh, of course, um, extinguishing with water or other you know, fluids uh, would kill the whole collection. So there is this installation also in there where we reduce in case of a fire the oxygen level um, to, mi to minimum for the fire to be sort of slowly <laughs> stopped but also if in case someone is in the archives uh, for people to still survive so th that was an interesting new new system for me to learn about um, in doing that project I, I told you already the climate within the building is, is extremely important. So facade is something that nobody uh, wants to see opened. And of course, for the reading room, it was important to have daylight, but also a kind of uh, dialogue with the, with the narrow street, but everything above had to be closed. So designing the facade was one of the main 
uh, topics uh, of this project. And you can see here under construction that it's actually really a closed concrete box uh, built with prefabricated concrete so that the moisture after installing it would also be very limited and in, in relation to pouring concrete in situ. For that facade from, from already in the competition, we worked together with um, an artist called Benoit Vaninis, uh, and we asked him to, together with us, think about what that facade could be. And we were, for different reasons, interested in making an exterior that had a lot of um, characteristics from an interior, making a, a timber structure, something between, you know, a cabinet um, and the scaffold, you could say. Um, and when he started working on the model, he first was extremely enthusiastic in composing many, many wooden elements, uh, different in depth and in, you know, height and in uh, thickness. Uh, but then it became clear that, especially because you never look at it frontal, that this was uh, far too complex. Uh, and then um, over time and over doing many variations, this is somehow the final proposal that we uh, came up with, where you feel a kind of mm, veil in wood between the reading room, which also needs quietness, obviously, and the street, and then the cladding, a purely compositional cladding, you could say, of um, the archives above. Uh, and here you see it the way one would never see it, but you see the proportions of the building here, um, which, which are actually a bit you know, more horizontal than one perceives within the city itself. Some drawings trying to get uh, from the model to working drawings. And here you can see an image of the building seen from the other side. So all the buildings you see before <laughs> reaching the wooden facade are part of the museum. And what was interesting in these, um, in, the, in the row of houses that you see where there's a, a, an interplay between brick and natural stone is that these houses were built um, at a moment where there was a transition from building in wood to building in stone. And it, it seems like they could change only one thing at a time. So they changed the material, but they stuck to the principles of building in wood. And it's something that we found very beautiful in, in this series of rhythms and tectonics and structures, windows, um, but also the horizontal bands and, and how that shifts from house to house. Uh, and in that sense, we thought it was interesting to kind of go back to wood and work uh, within the perspective of the street also with uh, these differing uh, lines uh, and shadows uh, in, in our new facade. That's then the cladded <laughs> version when uh, looking back where you saw the, the concrete volume at the beginning. So you see that also the light uh, plays a really important uh, role. We try to look at a right level of glossiness or shine on the, on, in, in finishing the wooden panels and in the slightly golden color uh, of the finish is important as well. Getting a bit closer. Um, after a while, we also decided that entering the reading room through the new building would actually reduce it quite a bit in size because you need, of course, to have a transition space because you can never open the window from outside directly into that room. So then we proposed to use the house in between that has been rendered, has been you know, changed over time. We didn't go back to any original there. No, it's not true. It is originally like that. It's actually the oldest house of the row. Um, but we used the ground floor room of that house as the entrance room uh, for the reading room and the archives. This is looking in uh, from the narrow street. So there is a very direct contact. Um, but as said, we decided then to use that uh, the little house next door to the left as a kind of antichambre to uh, entering the room. So here you see them together, the entrance door 
and the new facade. Um, that's then the room you enter. So that's where you also need to leave all your belongings <laughs> behind. Apparently the security of the reading room is also uh, very high because um, in the past people, you know, have even taken the liberty to take pages out of the beautiful books and just take them home. So it's all very, um, very secure and very strict how to enter. Um, and that's then the door to the new uh, interior. An interior that we wanted to um, make quite rich um, in its materials and treating all the surface with equal importance in relation to also, you know, if you visit a museum to have a kind of continuity uh, in attention and in detail uh, to the new room. Um, this is one of the drawings we made, testing also the color of the ceiling, um, materials and shades of, of the interior. And um, just a small detour again, uh, of course, um, there is a structure necessary to um, carry uh, the archives above. And as I said, the whole um, building had to be built in prefabricated concrete. And you see that this is actually the bare structure that we started from to then imagine a kind of cladded uh, interior room. And although we were excited about that one column, we thought the way it sits there, it's not so exciting to build an interior around. So um, we started to invent more columns and more beams to structure the room um, that we wanted to create. And this was also quite a moment of revelation somehow, because I think all of us were educated in a sense that honesty and structure was the only way to deal with architecture. You know, honesty was a word that was used very often and all the rest was considered as fake, I, I, I would say. So taking, talking about this first, immediately we thought, no, 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 you cannot do that. But then moving forward with it, it was so liberating to just indeed create, you know, create an interior and suggest a structure that you find more interesting than the necessary structure uh, for the building. And we were working at the same time at an, um, a house in Bruges, which was um, also redone at the end of the 19th century and not just redone as in restored, but really recreated to become more medieval than it had ever been. And when we finally uh, found the drawings of that house in the archives of, in Bruges, we saw that the kind of solid wooden beams in that interior were actually cladded um, eye uh, sections in steel. And so it landed somehow at the same moment on our tables in the office, these two projects. And it was also uh, interesting to see whether one could still take on that 19th century architect role, you know, can we still do that? And it was a big pleasure to, to create uh, and recreate um, and elaborate on an interior um, so much. So that is um, the result. So you see uh, the terrazzo floors with the shadow of the structure and then um, columns clad with veneered <laughs> wooden panels. Um, same for the beams uh, and a lot of uh, brass um, to bring in more detail, but also to hide a lot of the ventilation uh, systems that are, of course, integrated uh, in, the, in the walls. The walls are also clad um, with uh, leather panels, uh, leather, a material that is also used very much in the historical uh, interiors, and that will, of course, change shade uh, over time. Not embossed in this case, just very simple, natural uh, leather panels and the very blue uh, ceiling that we taught. You can see here also the man consulting the book. It's, it's really wonderful. It's these big illuminated uh, books that they put on cushions so that the backs wouldn't break and they, they're treated with so much care. Um, it's, it, it was a practice that, you know, you sometimes see in, in museum displays, you see the books on the cushions, but it's actually also really the way um, 
the books have to be treated. Then maybe moving up briefly to the space above. So you see it here in gray. Um, we brought in a new staircase in the back of the house and elevators and then all the material is um, uh, kept in these shelves that can very slowly be moved <laughs> electronically, not by hand because the shock for the books would be uh, too much. So um, it's quite an interesting contrast how to keep those collections, how to consult them, and then how to see them in their historical uh, context. That brings us to a very, very different project on the edge of the city. Um, it's a project um, that was also uh, the result of a competition and a very specific competition because it's, it happened a few times since then, but it was the very first time. So you see the red dot here um, on a site that is mostly known by people who drive in and out the city to work there on a daily basis. And, and the corner of that uh, spot is also where most of the people coming, driving along the river, take a left turn, and it's like marking the moment that you really leave the city or the other way around that you enter. Um, this is the area. Uh, you can see uh, in, the, in the right top corner, um, the Palace of Justice that was built by Richard Rogers um, and, and is under construction in this, uh, in this aerial photograph. And our site is in the middle of uh, the image and was a former garbage disposal, uh, how do you call it, plant. So trucks would drive there, would drive up and then empty their garbage down onto a huge stack and then it was being um, processed. Um, so this, the plot became available um, to make an uh, electricity uh, high tension station, like a mother <laughs> uh, high tension cabin uh, for the whole city. And the, the electricity company that wanted to build it there was asked by the city to do a competition because uh, the city wanted this building to become a landmark. Normally these installations are spread out over a larger plot of land uh, where the transformation of the electricity is kind of organized in a very logic way. Here, uh, the idea of landmark, of course, brought to the, brought to the surface the question of how to stack how to make something high. It had to become a landmark. And that's quite funny because um, the city was planning to develop the area, the industrial area behind it uh, to become one of the new industrial, uh, but um, let's say low industry, I would say soft industry areas of the city. And this building should mark uh, where that area would start. This is the location as we visited, just to give you an idea, it's really uh, the, the locations on the left behind these concrete paneled uh, fences, I would nearly say wall, uh, and along this uh, very beautiful, but very uh, leading to nowhere <laughs> uh, road. Turning left is then to leave the city. So that is actually the main street. Um, why I called it a special project is because of course, as architects, we're always asked to make buildings for people, uh, buildings where the relation between the interior and the exterior is extremely important, uh, both in experience, but also visually, uh, how they meet. Uh, and all of these things were totally irrelevant when designing uh, this building for machines. So you see one of the inhabitants here, um, and this is, you know, this is what happens in the building. Uh, we were excited because we thought maybe this is our one opportunity to design a building without bathrooms, but uh, this was not the case. <laughs> so also here, uh, of course, for the people coming here for maintenance, um, there had to be a bathroom in the building. Uh, we were interested in stacking. Uh, so we tried to find out in the competition how to stack the process vertically. Uh, and what was interesting is that um, we worked together, of course, with the structural engineer and the, the highest forces he had to calculate the building for was if there would be uh, a short circuit uh, in the building. Uh, so 
uh, an electricity cut, then, then that would create a kind of really uh, strong, nearly blast that the building would be, have to be able to, to deal with. Um, stacking was one thing, of course, uh, we were then quite um, puzzled by how to materialize it. And we were interested in creating for this um, high-tech content, a kind of low-tech skin. Uh, and one where the hand of the maker would somehow be present. So to have this, this contrast or this, you know, complementary aspect about making a building like that. We chose to do it in concrete and um, working on it, we tried to make it as simple as possible. Of course, when you stack at a certain moment, you're thinking of, uh, you know, stacking irregularly, but suddenly accepting a very uh, simple volume was quite interesting. And then we pushed in uh, a part to allow natural ventilation because there's a lot of heat production in the building. So at the front, you have this, it's like a gill of a fish pushed in and at the back, there's small perforations where the hot uh, air can leave the building. And if you look carefully at these sections and uh, facades, you also see that um, the building is a little bit tilted. It's not really, um, how do you say, straight. It's just slightly. And we were interested in that, in the sense that a concrete building, which communicates solidity as its kind of base, a character um, walking along the, the mostly northern uh, French coast, you see, of course, very often these bunkers that, although so strong, they, you know, they're slowly disappearing, being taken over by the sand. Uh, this is a, um, an image from a book by Paul Virilio, uh, Bunker Archaeology. And we thought both the handmade aspect and the fact that it seems to be a bit unstable was interesting, together, of course, with the fact that this location always had, the, um, had had the name Petrol because of the petrol industry behind it. We started to discuss what actually the color Petrol would mean. Um, it's a blue, but it's also a green. And this is a painting by Josef Albers, where you also see that the tension between the colors, of course, has a very strong impact and how you perceive each one of them. If you would change the order, you would also have a very different feeling for foregrounds and backgrounds. And that was also the idea of pushing in that uh, part of the building to create a composition of colors through uh, the shadows. We then started to reflect upon um, the scale of the building and especially the scale of the texture. Um, and often, Concrete wooden formwork is built with planks of 10 centimeters, but with a building of 25 meters high, this seemed to be um, too little. So we started to combine a number of planks and then nearly artificially had concrete pouring through the joints in between the planks. So this is a mock-up of trying to find out how much the concrete should pour out. <laughs> and how many planks we should combine to, to create a scale that we like. And this is then how it was constructed with these huge uh, formwork panels and the stitches in between, really each time cleaned and then stuck and then newly interwoven with each other, um, growing um, like this uh, and like this from high up relation with the city, the cathedral in the background, uh, to lead up to this building, um, which was also very attractive in concrete. Many of our colleagues even say it should have remained concrete, but we still wanted to paint it in petrol blue. And you can see we spend a lot of time here at different moments of the day with different types of daylight to find out now what would be the real petrol blue. Um, and yeah, I think in the end, it became a mix out of two of those uh, to become this building. 
Um, and you see that the shadows, you know, the 30 centimeter lines kind of, um, we felt were the right decision not to make it even finer, uh, that fabric. Um, and that's how it looks, the details and the shadows and the building in its kind of natural habitat with um, the container um, depots just, just beside it. We could convince also the client not to put um, their logo on it. So they, they invested a lot more than in a normal uh, high tension you know, transformation uh, installation. And um, they uh, wanted to show, of course, <laughs> How, much, how big their effort was, but we could convince them. And actually many people uh, still don't know really what's happening uh, in that building. Many years later, uh, you see the red dot of the building where we were, uh, and you see uh, Richard Rogers, uh, very <laughs> present uh, footprint of the Justice Palace. Uh, and close to it, you see a second red dot, which um, funnily enough was a, uh, another one of these buildings at the service of our lives in the cities. And uh, it is a heating plant that was built because uh, in that in-between space along the river uh, in, the, in the last years, uh, a completely new uh, residential and working neighborhood has been and still is being created. And the idea was to mark it as the most sustainable new neighborhood in Europe even, that was the ambition as in many other cities. And to do that, they wanted uh, to create a central heating station for all these buildings. Um, it was a competition. And um, yeah, we, we were selected to work on it. And you can see here one of the first uh, sketches we made. And maybe to go back to the plan for one second, you see that the building is located along uh, one of the main entrance and exits ro exit roads of the city. So you're immediately on the highway when passing through Roger's uh, building. Um, and they wanted to put the heating station in the park next to the new, um, to the new buildings. But when working on it, we found out really quickly that the chimneys that you would need, six of them, had to be 50 meters high, uh, which is really, really huge. And we found that if you would put all of that in the park, it somehow was too much and too high. So we proposed to move the location to closer to the road and embed the building in the talus that would anyway be built uh, between the highway and, and the park uh, for, for reasons of um, acoustics, obviously. Um, it would also allow the building to be um, accessed, let's say for uh, its use or its logistics uh, from the road and have a much softer access from within the park, which we thought uh, made much more sense. And um, apparently the jury uh, followed that. Now making a chimney um, and an industrial or, or sort of technical building in that location, uh, we were uh, thinking of how to do that. And um, the chimneys on their own, they can't stand. So you have to build a whole structure around that to make that stable. Um, and we proposed to, if we had to build the structure anyway, to turn it into a tower that would be accessible from within the park and would serve also as a viewing tower uh, in that very edgy condition uh, of the city. Um, it would have, so from the ring road to the right of the, uh, in the right side, to the right side of the section, you could have the trucks and everyone uh, coming to the plant <laughs> of the building. And then on the left side, you see a kind of visitor room, which would then also give information of what happens there, but also give you a way up uh, onto that structure. Um, and that led somehow to this composition of a kind of a hut in the park and then a technically looking but a little bit clumsy tower uh, behind it. And I say that because um, when working on it, this idea of uh, us to become more and more sustainable always comes or still very often comes 
with believing in technological progress. Um, this artificiality that we have to install to somehow reach another uh, way of getting closer to nature or to a natural environment, we found quite intriguing. And uh, we started to look at artificial landscapes and artificial rocks. And um, an artist by chance passing by pointed at this uh, actually first Flemish landscape painter called Joachim Patinir. Uh, he was born at the end of the, of the 15th century, but um, made his, his, uh, his major works in the beginning of the 16th century and lived um, in Antwerp, actually. He wasn't born there, but he, he had his ateliers there. And he had never traveled, but had came up with these amazing ideas of rocks and mountains, uh, just you know, from that imagination or of, through hearsay. Uh, and this, of course, here depiction of, of Hieronymus in his hut in that landscape with that beautiful rock above was for us quite um, a beautiful image to try to re-establish with this technological strange rock that we were about to create. So you see some construction uh, pictures here where the concrete base um, then carries that steel structure with the staircase going up, um, looking up through the, you know, the walk um, all the way up within the middle, of course, the opening where the chimneys would have to be inserted and how that uh, structure addressed um, the highway uh, alongside it. In the back, you see already the buildings uh, being under construction uh, of that new neighborhood. In its form, we also liked um, a kind of imperfection um, to, as maybe as a provocation also of that technological content. And we cladded it with metal sheets um, that would be slightly tilted one in relation to the other, referring of course also to the air ducts uh, that we now have to, <laughs> in huge dimensions, bring into all the projects uh, that every one of us is doing. Um, this is a nearly finished uh, situation where you see that we, when walking up, we left out uh, the triangles uh, on the different sides of the building to offer uh, different views along uh, the way up. Um, here you see the concrete base and then the chimney structure um, from a bit closer. Um, and walking around it then, it takes of course a very different position within the park and has also very uh, different um, proportions. Uh, and then this picture was made over winter uh, and we thought this was really uh, extremely beautiful, um, how the colors of the landscape suddenly and the sky and the tower started to merge and how that hut would nearly would, one would want a fireplace in there became like the moment where you could, you know, find some warmth or find shelter uh, in these colder times. Um, it's an image that then immediately made us think about this painting of um, Peter Brugel, uh, the elder, uh, where uh, of course the Belgian landscape or the Flemish landscape uh, and ice skating uh, had been depicted many times, but as you see here, it wasn't um, chimneys or factories, but it was very often the church that was uh, sort of in the background or forming the decor uh, for that uh, activity. So uh, also, uh, 16th century. Actually, uh, Bruegel uh, was born more or less at the moment that Patinir died. So he's the next uh, generation uh, of landscape painters. Moving up in Antwerp, two very different uh, conditions. We come to the Eilandsche, um, where you see the pink, uh, pinkish red um, rectangular building being uh, the one I will talk about. It is part, as you see, of a whole new development within a similar urban fabric uh, master plan at the time, um, which made some decisions. <laughs> Maybe we wouldn't make any more today. 
But um, you can also see to the left, there's the, I don't know if you see my cursor, but um, the, there's the two towers already built um, in this um, drawing by uh, Dina and Dina, which would then be extended. They're not on the drawing yet by um, David Chipperfield and, and Tony Fretton uh, a bit later. If we zoom in to this uh, city block, you could say it was a competition that we entered uh, with, uh, in a collaboration with three other offices, uh, being uh, at the time uh, the Wilderwink Tailleux uh, office, Kerstin Geers and David van Severen, and also Meta, uh, architect from uh, Antwerp. And uh, we did a competition for the whole block, so the full perimeter, each of the offices having uh, two buildings in that. And the master plan also in its volum volumetry was made as a translation of an organically grown city. I think uh, one can say many things about that. We, we found it quite awkward. Uh, and the jury in the end decided to give the bottom part to the group of four architects uh, that we were part of and the top part to four other architects. So all of a sudden, the balance that we tried to find in the organically grown city, um, of course, was, was lost a bit on the way. Um, maybe, yeah, to show you, we, we were working on this corner building and uh, maybe unlike one would expect, the corner here was kept as the lowest building uh, of, that, uh, of that half uh, of the block. Um, and um, so working on it, we uh, developed a number of typologies of living. Um, I won't explain them in too much detail, but this is the ground floor plan where you see halfway an entrance um, to go to the upper levels. On top of that, you see two um, terraced houses, so individual uh, houses with their own front door on the street. And at the bottom part, it's an apartment on one level, but which also has like a back entrance uh, to their winter garden balcony um, on the corner. Um, on the upper floors, then you have three, the, all the apartments are different. So you have three apartments with one central one that would only look out on the street, a corner one, and then one apartment that would also bridge to that collective garden uh, at the back. And with then a really obvious uh, penthouse with two flats uh, on top of that. Within our collaboration, uh, we, defined the, the expression of the warehouse as um, the language that we would all work with. Uh, and we were interested uh, in working with the shades of green um, and <laughs> as a choice. Um, our, our corner building, I said, it's the lowest one. So the corner suddenly is sort of, um, yeah. Uh, uh, a sort of recess uh, in all sense, but um, uh, which, which gives, of course, very strange uh, ends of the other buildings. Um, and we were interested in that idea of warehouse, but with again having a grid of windows that would not fully obey the system. So there are slight shifts, but that then again are very much. Um, controlled by uh, working with square tiles, which with their light joints here also have really like the aspect of a checked sheet of paper on which you draw a composition uh, nearly, nearly correct, uh, I would say. You see the entrance in the larger and the longer facade um, and to the right side, you see the small door, um, which also leads up to the ground floor flat uh, here. I'll just show you some images. Maybe, maybe to be complete, to the left side, you have uh, the building of Meta um, with its greenish concrete. And to the right side, it's the building of um, the Wilderwing Tailleux. And they worked with these glossy white bricks with green, uh, green joints. Um, so that's the organically grown <laughs> planned city. Uh, here you see the facade with its slight uh, you know, movement of windows, uh, although they all have similar uh, dimensions uh, in one, and then the frontal view, 
where you can also see the, the balconies uh, having these uh, framed, um, that's that simple glazed opening up uh, the winter gardens uh, in each flat. So you can, with the seasons, you can open up or close it off uh, as you wish. The, the, the not surprise of working with these dark green, uh, shiny tiles was that the, the reflections can be really strong when you go there, depending on the light and the shadows of the buildings around it. Um, it's really a pleasure to always look at what happens with that uh, texture. And from there, and the lady in the picture also wearing a green coat, I think that was a nice coincidence. Uh, this brings us to uh, the last project I would like to show you, which is uh, outside uh, Antwerp to the north. Um, as you can see, just to locate, help you locate again on this, uh, on this map. Um, and this is a very, very different uh, context to build in. It's, um, you could say it's an area which is quite wealthy and where many people live in uh, villas, still building villas. Uh, it's, it's really a place that still grows, very, very uh, sought after. Many people want to live like that. And our project um, is for an organization called CODA who have had since the beginning, I think since the end of the 90s actually, um, uh, at their, um, or they, they could use an old, let's say an old farmhouse be, that had belonged to a monastery um, to house or to offer uh, care for people that were terminally ill. And they have done that for 20 years in those uh, buildings with a lot of volunteers uh, helping. It's an extremely caring environment. And actually, I believe that the fact that they did it in an existing building contributed to that, to people living there for a few days over a few weeks, maximum a few months, to people visiting. The old buildings, I can show you, had, you know, because of the fact that they weren't built to be a care home, had a certain imperfection and a certain domestic quality about them that made everyone feel immediately at home and definitely didn't feel you um, entering an institution. Um, the competition organized also by uh, the Vlaams Baumeister at the time, Peter Swinnen, who had this program on pilot projects uh, in care, he called them invisible care, asked to look into reusing these buildings, but already understood that most likely one would have to replace them by a new building um, because this was too small and you know had obviously a number of disadvantages in accessibility in transformability that were you know limiting how to professionalize more and more uh, the institution we were intrigued by the roofs and we were intrigued by this view um, out in the landscape that was protected. So a view that would not be uh, given up or would not be transformed again into fields of uh, one or single family houses, um, but a field that had a beautiful horizon and depth. It didn't end somehow, uh, but also changed beautifully over the seasons. Um, and I think I, I'd start with this very, um, <laughs> uh, um, close up of a plan already of how we tried to approach uh, the program. The question was to design um, 13, they called it guest houses, um, to be placed within a larger setting, obviously. Um, and we designed them in such a way that each of them would have from the bed a view out through that door that you see drawn out towards that horizon. And, and the organization of that plan was fully there to make that happen. What was interesting in the brief is that the client wanted to have a guest house, saying it would be composed obviously of that bedroom and bathroom, 
um, as other hospital rooms, but would also have a guest area. Um, so you'd have a living room, you could eat in your room if you wanted, but also uh, if wished, um, close family or friends could stay over um, at night and uh, be there um, when needed. Um, something that is often asked, especially in the last uh, days uh, of someone's life. What was also interesting, what they had learned of having that organization um, on that specific location is that what counted very much for um, their guests and was appreciated over and again was a possibility to go outside, whether it was winter, spring, summer. People loved it to be pushed outside in their bed uh, to make a walk even, but also just to be outside their room. So that's also why each, each house has this big door to a terrace, which is partly covered by a roof where people could just uh, be outside, smell, hear, you know, feel the rain and the wind uh, whenever they wanted. So this, this unit, <laughs> it's a word I don't like, but this the composition of room was then the base to develop a plan. Uh, you see here a number of sketches we made and we thought this representation like we see and we like so much in the drawings of, of Heinrich Dessenau, giving a feeling of domestic qualities, interiors, fabrics, um, you know, details and patterns of materials on floors and walls. We thought that was kind of an appropriate way to try to understand what we were creating. Um, so we made uh, these for the room. This is looking back from the guest room to the bedroom um, and outside. Um, and then organizing the rooms was one thing. So the building has this group of 13 um, hospital rooms um, organized together in a hospice, but it, that's on the left side. On the right side, it also has a daycare center for people who are very ill, but can still stay at home, but, um, are here one or, or more days during the week, um, let's say just during the day, so that the people that care for them at home can also still work or have a bit of time off, which is sometimes very needed. And that is what we grouped then in these larger rooms, these, these enfilade of larger rooms uh, in the, at, the, at the bottom of the horizontal part of the building. Um, and you can see that these rooms start somehow to the left in the hospice as being the living room and shared kitchen of the people in the hospital. And then without having to go through corridors to sort of feel that you go to another wing, this enfilade continues to the daycare center. And it's very important, I think, because the people who end up in the hospice who decide to come there um, to die, very often they have been in the care center, the daycare for many months. And so they know the people who are there, they know the caretakers there. And in the beginning, when they move to the hospice, they still take their lunches and meals also um, in the daycare center. So although these are administratively very different institutions, we try through the architecture to, to make that at least invisible and to give it a sense of continuity and amicality and hospitality that uh, we felt was very much needed in this. You see at the top of the horizontal part, there is um, this more offices, but it's also um, care offered for people um, that, that don't live here or don't come here, but need like support. Uh, when they take care of someone in their family who is very ill, they can come here to get, um, get support and try to understand you know, how it works or, or meet people who are in the same uh, position. Uh, quite important is that the building has two important entrances, one here in the middle where the two kind of volumes meet. Uh, you come in and look immediately uh, into, the, into the living room and through the building to the garden. But from that central entrance hall, you can also look left and right and see the two interior gardens that we made in the building. 
that create on the one hand, of course, daylight inside, but also offer always different routes to walk through the building. If you want to meet people, you can take the, let's say, obvious route through the rooms or the corridor, but you can also always take another shortcut um, just to be on your own if you want. The second entrance is at the right side. Mm -hmm. It leads to the daycare center. And also when you come in there, you look through these two uh, gardens all the way through the building. Um, this enfilade of living rooms leading from the daycare to the hospice um, is what we drew here. So it's really rooms with different characters where people at the same time can you know, install themselves and do different things. It was quite helpful to work on this project to stay a day uh, in the house with the guests and with the care, uh, caretakers and try to understand the dynamics. Because uh, we found it quite challenging to think that we would know <laughs> how to design uh, for this use and for this face in someone's life. Also, is this housing? What do people take here? Is this your last house? Is it a hotel? What is it and how could you through the architecture bring certain notions of belonging um, into the place? That was something we, we really tried to, to grasp and work hard on. Oh, this is a plan again. This is a section through uh, these two gardens that then split up the building and you see that the whole building is uh, characterized by pitched roofs. I'll also show you, um, maybe it's in the next, uh, yeah, it, it, this is the volume that it led to and it's also positioned not parallel to the road, uh, but in a slight angle, uh, picking up the angle of the existing building now, which is probably something that you know, an angle that belongs in a, in a past where roads were still a bit different. Or, but we thought if we have to demolish it, we sort of looked at a reincarnation uh, through orientation and, and roofs. I found this aerial photograph, <laughs> which was quite interesting, uh, where you see still the old building uh, with its uh, red roofs, uh, roof tiles uh, on the top. And then you see how close we tried to build with that reincarnation actually, uh, and how we picked up on that strange orientation towards the, uh, the road, uh, which you see in the, in the left uh, part of the image. Um, so yeah, this is a situation that does no longer exist. Uh, it was quite touching actually to find it on Google Earth uh, a bit earlier today. So um, I am happy that uh, I have it. This is the new um, site plan. Uh, you see that one part of the building uh, that was demolished is kept. It's, a, it's the former stables uh, and it will be used as a communal room uh, in, the, in the future. And it's quite nice to feel both in material and in angle that they belong together. And then the garden uh, was designed uh, by Jan Minne, a landscape architect uh, we love to work with and uh, who, who made a kind of uh, garden that would be interesting to walk um, many times but also be pushed around in the bed that would have smells and colors in each season so whatever time of the year you would be there uh, it would have to be a feast uh, to see oh I think I skipped yeah <laughs> skipped this beautiful drawing he made where he because they also have animals um, on the side people love to take care of and uh, it's this, this quality of this drawing, I hope we will achieve somehow uh, in a few years when everything will have taken or had the time to grow uh, fully. Uh, so I'll take you just around um, uh, the building. We don't have interior pictures yet because it's been finished very recently. And with the pandemic, it wasn't really the best period to then go inside uh, to make photographs. Um, which is delicate in any case. Uh, so you see that um, the roofs, um, they always have the same angle, but we, we, we tweaked a bit on the volume, making sometimes larger covered areas uh, or more explicit outdoor spaces, and sometimes keeping it very strict to the, to the buildings defining the interior. 
uh, rooms. So this is the main entrance to the hospice. Um, and um, the structure of the roof we kept visible, the way it was built, but also um, the wooden column is somehow, we thought a welcoming element where even if you go out and want to rest a bit or go out to smoke a cigarette, it's like waiting for you to lean against and caress you somehow. Um, the entrance to the hospice. So the building is built with, uh, with, with bricks, obviously, but also uh, certain parts we finished with render uh, in different uh, shades. So although it's a big institution, um, there would be some uh, very different aspects to its appearance and somehow also inconsistencies. Um, building imperfectly is difficult. I mean, it's always imperfect <laughs> on the level of what contractors do and what we do obviously as well, but bringing in a kind of artificial imperfection to make you feel more relaxed somehow, more as if it's a place that has been adjusted over time, that is quite, uh, quite a challenge. Um, so then the, the covered outdoor spaces of the, the enfilade of living rooms facing um, the south and facing that beautiful view. The garden is not yet uh, installed. And these are uh, a series of hospital rooms uh, where you see these doors uh, that would lead into the bedroom, but also that can be used by guests who visit on regular basis. Everyone has a kind of a front door, so you don't have to enter the institution. You can you know, just knock, knock and enter. Uh, as if you really visit just one person. Um, and the roofs then covering the, the terrace, the balcony, uh, somehow protection also against the weather. So this is then how, although repetitive, um, the, the working with, with the different uh, finishes and colors and changing where you use them brought in um, the large and the small and the other way around, I think. Um, and walking around to the other side, we see here um, uh, a number of other rooms um, going back to the front. The inner uh, courtyards I spoke about, the inner gardens, uh, this one is very long and narrow and has also the higher volumes where some offices are located on the first floor surrounding it and it really brings in a kind of street or place to discover, so somehow a village. Uh, muse, you could say, uh, which is, is very nice also as a shortcut through the building. Um, and the other one more squarish uh, uh, being at the heart of the, uh, the hospice. With then uh, as a final image, the view from within that uh, beautiful landscape back uh, at how uh, at the moment um, the hospice and the care center lie there with these beautiful trees protecting them uh, from the road. Thank you very much for listening. At Brickworks van der Mortel, we make high quality bricks, slips and clay pavers in unique colors and sizes. From our new brick lab in Belgium, we support architects in the UK and around Europe. As a partner, we collaborate with the architect to transform his vision into reality with an open mind, technical knowledge and tailor-made solutions. As a family-held company, we remain accessible at all levels, which makes our company extremely customer-focused. In all those years, we never lost our core values and stand for sustainability, quality, teamwork and, of course, our passion that we would love to share with you.